All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ROAR annual community meeting of 2023. It's really exciting uh, to have you all here today. Thank you very much for making the time. So we're waiting for a few other people to join. So while we're doing so, please, uh, if you'd like, please go ahead and open up the chat window and introduce yourself and share where you're joining from today and any other interesting information you'd like to let us know about what you're doing with ROAR or how you heard about ROAR or if this is your very first ROAR call, things like that. So head on over to chat and say hello and we will get started with the rest of the meeting in a few minutes. Hello and welcome everyone who's just joining. We are in chat right now saying hello and doing some introductions. So you can head on over there if you've just joined. Great to see everyone here, some more first timers, which is exciting. People from located uh, all over the world. Some cold weather and some sunny weather that everyone is experiencing in different places, depending on where you are. And some exciting updates about ROAR activities that people are working on. So if you've just joined, welcome. So excited to have you here. We're doing some introductions in chat. So please take a moment to say hello and introduce yourself. All right, so we're at a few minutes after, so I'm going to kick off the rest of the meeting, but please continue to say hello and interact in the chat window, especially if you've just joined and you haven't had a chance to introduce yourself. So I'll just take a moment to briefly say hello and introduce who I am. I'm Maria Gould. I'm the ROAR project lead and very happy to be with all of you today to celebrate the anniversary of ROAR and let you all know what is going on with everything at ROAR these days. So thanks again for being here. So the plan for today's call is to start with some welcomes and introductions, which we are doing right now. And then we're going to take a few moments to provide everyone with a kind of reintroduction to, to ROAR and, and explain some of the basics of what ROAR is trying to do and, and how it works. We know some of you are joining this call today uh, for the very first time. And we also know there are a lot of familiar faces, uh, which is great, but we just wanna uh, kind of take a moment to acknowledge uh, how ROAR is operating right now and provide you with all of those details. And then we will provide some updates on various activities that have been underway with ROAR over the past year and tell you a little bit about our plans for the coming year. And 
if you have questions or comments about any of that, we'll be very happy to hear them. And then we'll close with uh, some information and details, especially for those of you who may be newer, about how you can get more involved in ROAR if you are interested in doing so and if you are not already involved in various activities. So that is the plan today. And thank you again for being here. So let me just start today with a brief introduction to the people and the organizations behind ROAR or Research Organization Registry. The ROAR is a collaborative initiative that is operated by three organizations, California Digital Library, Crossref, and DataSight. So ROAR itself is not its own organization. It's really meant to be operated as this collaborative initiative. And our three organizations have been running ROAR since it first launched four years ago. And we have a small core team of people right now who are dedicated to working on ROAR, who are based at those three operating organizations. And these are the people with whom you probably interact most frequently and you'll hear from a lot on the call today. I think they've already introduced themselves in the chat, but just to highlight them here as well and acknowledge the many contributions they make to ROAR. We have Liz Krasnarich, the technical lead based at DataSight, Amanda French, our technical community manager based at Crossref, and Adam Buttrick, our metadata curation lead, also based at Crossref. So you'll hear from them in a little bit. And next, I'd also like to acknowledge the ROAR Steering Group. This is an advisory group that works closely with our three operating organizations to provide strategic guidance to ROAR. And the steering group really is meant to represent ROAR's global community, as well as the diversity of infrastructures and organizations that all have a stake in ROAR. So, I especially like to acknowledge the, the work that they do to help guide our strategic vision. And I'd also like to, to introduce and recognize ROAR's Curation Advisory Board, which is a volunteer group that helps to develop ROAR's curation policies and practices and coordinate updates to the registry. And you'll hear a, a little bit later on about the process by which we are curating the registry. And that is, you know, by and large, uh, really a function of the work that the Curation Advisory Board has put into developing this model. And I'd also like to mention that ROAR's three operating organizations provide fundamental resourcing for ROAR's basic operating expenses, but this support uh, has also been supplemented with outside contributions from stakeholder organizations. So I just want to take a moment to, to recognize and express my gratitude for uh, the many supporting organizations who have contributed to helping ROAR um, over the past few years. Thank you all very much. And lastly, I want to acknowledge all of you who are here today. You are all an integral part of ROAR, even if you're joining for the very first time today. And you are all crucial to what we are doing at ROAR as a community-based initiative. So thank you all for being here and for being part of what ROAR is doing. So now I'm going to provide a brief overview of ROAR and what we do. This uh, may be familiar information for some of you here, but I want to make sure to cover the basics for those who might be a little newer to this initiative. So ROAR is the Research Organization Registry, and we provide a freely and openly available data set of persistent identifiers for research organization affiliations. And all of this data is curated through a community-based process and centralized transparent practices that are visible and available on GitHub. We provide open tools for accessing and querying and integrating the data in ROAR. And ROAR is especially designed to be easily integrated with other identifiers and in other scholarly initiatives. And as part of that, 
uh, we have uh, signed on to and we follow the principles of open scholarly infrastructure or POSI uh, to make sure that we are, are adhering to best practices for the long term sustainability and openness of the infrastructure we are supporting. And a big part of that is that this is an initiative that is um, being developed uh, with, for, and by uh, community stakeholders. And so this is really key to how ROAR operates. And one of the reasons why we do calls like this to bring everybody together uh, and get your feedback and, and your input and involvement in what we are building. So uh, these bullet points here are really just uh, a few ways to kind of summarize and describe at a high level what ROAR is and, and what we're trying to do. And now taking a closer look inside the registry, uh, you can see um, the kinds of data that, that we have and that we are actively curating. So every record that is in ROAR, every organization in ROAR has a unique identifier or ROAR ID, and that's um, shown um, in the example on this slide, the ROAR ID is in the upper left-hand corner of the record interface. In addition to the unique ROAR ID, we include metadata that helps with discovery and disambiguation, including different versions of an organization's name, including translations, uh, information about the, where the organization is located, and other organizations that it may be related to. We also include crosswalks or other identifiers uh, when, when these are available. So in the example shown on the slide, you can see that uh, the for the University of Geneva record in ROAR, we've captured several other identifiers, including the Crossref funder ID, um, ISNI, and Wikidata. Now, ROAR IDs are used for a variety of purposes, but primarily fall into uh, a few common types of cases. And the first one is, uh, is being able to disambiguate organizations where um, this kind of information is being collected in different systems, like when an author submits a manuscript. And a second um, category or, or type of use uh, for ROAR is being able to produce scholarly metadata and include ROAR IDs for affiliation information in that metadata. And thirdly, uh, a common type of use for ROAR IDs is um, to be able to um, easily consume scholarly metadata and filter or query on the affiliation details that are included. So these are kind of the overarching types of ways in which we see ROAR IDs being used uh, and being useful. Just to give you another, uh, another window or example into how ROAR can function in research and publication workflows uh, in a, um, example scenario, ROAR really functions as a, a critical piece of metadata that moves through the, the research and publication workflow, really operating invisibly in the background. So it's not something that anyone really needs to know about if you're a researcher, uh, but it's a key piece of information that can help to help to fill downstream use cases. So for example, if a researcher is submitting a manuscript and the system is integrated with ROAR, the researcher is asked to provide an affiliation and selects from ROAR's controlled list, but the ID itself may not, um, it's likely not even visible to the researcher, but it's just stored in the background. When that research is published, the metadata for that output can include the ROAR ID for the researcher's affiliation. And then that research, um, all of the research associated with that particular affiliation uh, can be made discoverable in research databases by querying on the ROAR ID. So just to show an example of how that can kind of fill into um, downstream impacts, on the left, I'm just showing an example of um, DOI metadata from a publication showing the ROAR ID for UC Berkeley included in the affiliation details. And then on the right is an example of how all of the data linked to the UC Berkeley ROAR ID can be picked up in downstream services like Data Site Commons to aggregate all of the works by that institution. And this is all happening because the ROAR ID is included in the DOI metadata and made openly available for other systems um, to access. So Amanda is helpfully including some links in chat um, to that um, particular query in, in Data Site Commons. So you can sort of try it out for yourself and see how it works. 
So these are just some um, snapshots and examples of how ROAR IDs uh, are being used um, and being useful in various kinds of research workflows right now to identify clean affiliation details uh, and be able to link them to research outputs and to researchers. So I'm just going to um, clarify a few things about the purpose of the registry and uh, what does it mean if an organization is in ROAR? This is a question uh, we tend to get sometimes. And so the first thing I want to clarify is that a ROAR record is really not meant to imply anything about a particular organization's ranking or quality. It's really about uh, being um, included in ROAR to reflect the fact that an organization has been or will be affiliated with research outputs and activities. So the, the main goal of providing the registry is to be able to provide these IDs uh, and associated metadata that can really address what we call the affiliation use case. And so that's kind of the core purpose of the registry. So this is not a registry of, um, of you know, institutional rankings uh, in any way. It's, it's really about providing this open registry of IDs that can be used to enrich metadata across the um, scholarly research landscape. So ROAR IDs for organizations in a way um, can be thought of as kind of similar to ORCID IDs for researchers, but the model is slightly different because of how we curate the registry. And this is uh, because we are coordinating updates and maintenance uh, for the registry through a centralized process uh, with this uh, community input through our curation advisory board, as opposed to having individual organizations be responsible for creating and maintaining their own records. And so it's that centralized and community-based process that is uh, helping to make sure that all of our metadata is consistently represented across the board and that we uh, can work to provide as much uh, coverage as possible in the registry. So uh, speaking of that process of how we update the registry, we're updating it right now on a rolling basis. Right now, that means we're putting out new updates to the ROAR data set approximately once a month, making those uh, that information available in the public search interface and in our open API and a public data dump. And anyone who wants to can submit feedback about new organizations they'd like to add to the registry or any corrections that need to be made to metadata in existing records. And all of those requests are reviewed through a centralized and transparent process. That process is carried out on GitHub. So anyone can go to the ROAR updates repository in GitHub and take a look at what is in the queue for future releases and even comment on issues if you have any feedback that you'd like to share there. And when we process uh, changes that go into uh, each registry update, uh, we're processing all of those changes in line with metadata policies and inclusion criteria that we have developed with our curation advisory board uh, and other stakeholders, including at community calls um, such as these uh, to really make sure that the practices and, and policies that we're applying to the registry records are um, in line with the global community of ROAR users and stakeholders. So uh, one thing um, I'd also like to mention by way of uh, reintroducing ROAR and how it works and how it's run is just tell you a little bit about the ROAR governance and sustainability model. So as I mentioned previously, we're operating ROAR as a collaborative initiative. And by we, I mean California Digital Library, Crossref, and Datasite. So our three organizations have been sharing responsibility for operating and resourcing and governing ROAR. All of that is outlined in a memorandum of agreement that is available on the ROAR website. And so that really helps us uh, make sure that we can keep ROAR going, um, ensure that the ROAR data and infrastructure is completely open and free for anyone to use, and that we have a baseline level of support for keeping ROAR going no matter what. And so we're not dependent on grants, we're not dependent on, on other ad hoc or, or time-limited funds uh, to operate ROAR. 
That being said, also, as I mentioned a, a moment ago, we do take in supplemental resourcing uh, from sustaining supporters uh, and have in the past and may continue in the future to have um, some grant funds for time limited projects, uh, but really focused on time limited funds only being used for time limited projects, uh, which is something that is outlined in COSI or the Principles of Open Scholarly Infrastructure. Uh, another um, update to the ROAR sustainability model is that as of November of last year, ROAR has been selected by SCOS uh, as essential open infrastructure, and we are now part of the SCOS funding cycle for the next three years uh, to encourage broader community investment in open infrastructure. So that is um, another way in which uh, we're really trying to build uh, and sustain ROAR for the long term um, as this uh, jointly operated uh, and community resourced initiative. And another um, key piece uh, of our governance model is being able to work with the steering group, uh, which I mentioned earlier, to really make sure that the um, directions that ROAR is going in and the, the models that we are applying for governance and sustainability are really developed with input from a broad set of stakeholders. And so um, something that I'd like to um, close with before we get into some more details about what we're working on uh, right now is just to uh, address some questions that you might have about what makes ROAR different from other types of organization identifiers that you might be working with or might have heard of. Uh, so uh, ROAR is not the, the first uh, or the only identifier for organizations, but we are... Uh, doing things uh, in, in a unique way uh, for uh, that really sets ROAR apart. And so a few things uh, that make ROAR unique and distinct and different from other types of identifiers are that we are providing the ROAR data set as completely um, open, available under a CC0 license, uh, available through an open API and a public data dump. All of ROAR is completely open and free for anyone to use. Uh, another, aspect of ROAR that sets it apart is that we're specifically focused on identifying affiliations and being able to solve this problem of how do we connect research outputs to research organizations and other elements uh, like researchers and grants and uh, funding organizations and things like that. And so really being able to focus on these um, scholarly um, publication use cases to be able to make it easier uh, to track research outputs by institutions. Another thing that makes Grower distinct is that Grower is really developed to work with other identifiers and in other scholarly infrastructures. So Grower is the default and primary identifier for affiliations that is supported in data site metadata, in crossref metadata, and in ORCID, for example. And so you know, ROAR is really not meant to um, be a registry that exists on its own uh, apart from other identifiers and other infrastructures, but it's really designed uh, to work with other, other PIDs uh, and in other infrastructures to help connect the dots um, through open metadata and make research outputs more, uh, more discoverable and trackable. And um, lastly, um, one of the things that, um, that really makes ROAR distinct is that it's designed for um, broad global usage and really developed as a community initiative, community meaning stakeholders from all over the world. And so that's one of the reasons why we are paying really close attention to how we curate the registry and making sure that we have coverage for in yeah, in places all, all over the world and making sure that all of the metadata in our records is um, as multilingual as possible um, to support broader discoverability and usability. And so this aspect of ROAR's global reach and the involvement that, um, that we've seen and will continue to see from um, people like you on this call today is really key to how we're operating ROAR. So that concludes my introduction or reintroduction to what ROAR is. And before I turn it over to others to talk about what we're working on, I will just 
take a quick look at chat and see if there are any questions that have come up that I can address or if anybody would like to post a question in chat now or raise your hand, you're welcome to do so. So seeing one question about how we determine the main name for a record. Uh, so this is a very interesting topic. Uh, we wrote an entire blog post of, about it, which uh, which we can put a link to in the chat. Uh, so I'm not sure, Adam, if you want to say a few words about how we do this, and then maybe we can address this um, toward, again toward the end of the call. Yeah, so uh, we refer to the organization itself um, for the primary name. Um, we did inherit seed data from GRID, which had a requirement of using English language for the primary name, which might be why you see a, kind of what you would think a non-official name uh, for the primary name, meaning it's rendered in English as opposed to a local language. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, generally we just refer to the organization itself and assign the uh, name based on that, you know, their, their website, their branding, their copyright statements, whatever their official name policies are. Um, it doesn't always correspond to a legal um, identify, a legal entity identifier name, which might be different, uh, you know, than an organizational name. Uh, but we do do our best to make it reflect kind of the, the top level preferred form. If you do come across records that where you feel like the name is far afield from what you think it should be for the primary for the organization, please do submit an update request and we can get those changed. Thanks, Adam. All right, so we'll have some more time at the end for some questions. So I'm going to keep things moving right now and feel free to post anything in chat as you wish. So I'm going uh, to turn now to my colleagues on the ROAR team to tell you about some things we've been working on at ROAR over the past year and what we'll be working on in the year ahead. So we'll first hear from Amanda to talk about ongoing work to support wider adoption of ROAR. And then we'll hear from Adam about what's going on with registry curation activities. And then we'll hear from Liz about technical development work. So over to you, Amanda. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Amanda French. I'm the technical community manager for ROAR and um, one of the main parts of that position, which I began last May, is to support people who are adopting ROAR and integrating it into their systems. So we've just begun to um, work on, on tracking these integrations. Um, it's actually not on the slide, but I'll mention that we know of about 80 people who are, you know, organization systems that are or, that are adopting ROAR right now, but we know that there are many more than that um, who are either working on it or who have already integrated it and just sort of haven't really told us about it. Um, so, you know, there's a number of different ways where we track um, the general usage of ROAR and the first stat on this slide. Um, is just who is using the ROAR API. And you can see that that has gone way up uh, last year, uh, more than doubled from the previous year. Uh, another way um, that we're sort of tracking integration is, as Maria was mentioning, um, adoption of ROAR by some of these other crucial pieces of scholarly infrastructure. Um, and in at the very beginning of, of last year in 2022, so it's been, uh, I think about a year now, Crossref launched support for ROAR IDs in its schema and APIs. And as Maria mentioned, Crossref is in fact the preferred affiliation identifier in Crossref metadata. metadata. So we have a few uh, notable integrations this year. Um, uh, Europe PMC, Open Science Framework, Bilstein Institute, FigShare, Science Data Bank, Fair Sharing, and the Swiss National Science Foundation. Um, we do have um, a, a longer list of uh, those integrators, and these are just the sort of notable ones from 2022. Um, and then just in general, we are seeing um, more national level research strategies and policies um, about adopting PIDs in general, notably, of course, the OSTP so-called so Nelson memo, which doesn't mention ROAR by name, but does encourage uh, the use of persistent identifiers in scholarly publishing systems. Um, so because of that, we have um, received a lot of interest in people who are looking to integrate war into their systems. Next slide, Maria. So uh, we do, as I, as I mentioned, we've, we're just sort of uh, trying to 
starting to try to track impact for impact and for integration in a really sort of systematic way. And one of the things we've begun to do a bit more often is to see, um, all right, how many war IDs are there in specifically DOI metadata? So a uh, data site adopted war back in 2019. Um, and you can see, um, you know, that just from July of 2022, there is a fairly shallow but significant slope up in the number of war IDs that are in DOIs uh, registered by data site. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see a similar but different looking <laughs> um, chart about uh, war IDs in Crossref metadata. Now, of course, these, these two slides I, I will mention do not have the same um, scale units and do not have the same time units. So please don't uh, compare them to one another. Um, I, but uh, there, it is quite a different time scale. Um, so you'll notice, of course, a big peak right there that actually falls right on August 1st, 2022. And that actually uh, reflects your PMC's um, addition, sort of a, a legacy backfill of RAW IDs for welcome grants and submitting those in DOIs to Crossref. So we have a, a great number of uh, grant DOIs in Crossref that do have RAW IDs. And it just kind of goes to show, again, fairly slight but significant increase, and also just the difference that one adoption can make um, in this kind, of, uh, this kind of data. Next slide. Um, so I'm very pleased to announce today um, that Scholastica has announced um, uh, sort of, a, I think, quite a major integration of Aurora into all of its uh, systems. So Scholastica um, provides software for a number of scholarly journals and has just uh, today launched both that actual feature in its systems and has written a really nice blog post and issued a press release about that integration. So I think um, literally after today, um, specifically those numbers in Crossref will go up because they've really um, made it possible in their systems for uh, publishers to easily send raw IDs to Crossref. And so uh, we're really thrilled about that. We're going to be doing a case study with Scholastica that's going to come out in March on the war blog. And um, we're going to talk to them as well for their blog. So um, please explore that. Um, and we are very happy and grateful to have Scholastica as a as an enthusiastic roar integrator. Um, I'm, we particularly appreciated Brian Cody saying um, that uh, he he considers this to be the roaring twenties, which is something that I wish I had thought of saying myself. Uh, so anyway, coming up in 2023 um, with this auspicious beginning, um, some planned activities that we have. Um, I'm gonna we're gonna contact all the integrators that we know of and all of the people who uh, were original signatories on a statement of support for Roar, and just try to get a really systematic progress update on what everybody's been doing. I've been talking to people on a sort of an ad hoc basis, um, and I wanted to sort of systematize that. Um, we have started publishing sort of what has been, I think, quite a popular case study series on the blog, and we're going to do more of those. We've got them actually scheduled out through April. If you're interested in having a case study um, written about you, please contact me. Um, more webinars, more events. Um, we have a, a notable planned event um, that will be coming up um, this spring. Um, the date is still to, to be de determined. Um, but while we have been concentrating on war in uh, publishing systems, we are also very keen to um, help repositories integrate WAR. So of course, the very first WAR integration was the Dryad Generalist Repository, but we know of many other um, repository systems. Um, and, and I mentioned Figshare as a notable adopter from this past year. Um, we know of many other repository systems that would like to integrate WAR, so we want to work better to support them. Um, we have several outreach um, opportunities this year. Uh, we're presenting at several conferences. Um, we're going to look at um, revamping uh, the community um, sort of workflow, as it will. The community calls are, are a wonderful way to get uh, updates on Roar, but we'd like to see if we can sort of better support sort of asynchronous um, continual communication with people who are integrating Roar or interested in Roar. And then finally, as I say, we, we are working to create a sort of a um, more formal 
impact dashboard to, to try to track the uh, increasing number of people who are using ROAR and what effect that's having on the rest of the scholarly communication landscape. And that's about it for me. Thank you, Amanda. Great update. So over to Adam. Thanks, Maria, and hello, everyone. I'm Adam Butchick. I'm the Metadata Curation Lead for ROAR. Uh, if you've ever sent an update <laughs> request in or added it, asked for a new record to be added, I'm the one who's handling it. Um, so to highlight some of the work we've accomplished in curation over the past year, um, in March of 2022, we began our independent curation of the registry, diverging from Digital Sciences Service Grid, which had provided us with our seed data, after a few successful releases beginning in July, uh, we moved to update the registry on a rolling basis. Uh, as Maria indicated, we're publishing new and updated records at least once per month, um, beginning from that point and often publishing more frequently than that. So we're very happy to have that going. Uh, over the course of the year, we published 18 releases based on feedback from Roar's community and processed through the community curation model that Maria discussed. Um, we also published several kind of quality releases, and improvements to our metadata across the board. Uh, in total, this resulted in us adding uh, 2010 new records and applying, oh, I got to read a lot of numbers, uh, 11,135 updates to 10,073 existing records, uh, which comprises approximately 10% of the total registry being updated um, in, in, in the eight months that we had independent curation. So I think that's, that's a great thing to have accomplished. Uh, to help support this volume of changes, we also onboarded two new curation team members, uh, Matthias Liffers from the Australian Research Institute of Commons and Shane Smillian from Crossref. They've both been invaluable in helping us to curate the registry, and we're glad to have them on board. Uh, we're still recruiting new curation uh, team members, so if you'd be interested in joining and contributing whatever knowledge you have about sort of the research organization landscape, you feel free to reach out to myself or Maria. Um, next slide, please. Should be seeing it. Oh, I'm not seeing it. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, okay, so moving ahead to what we're working on for 2023, um, we began working with regional partners to improve the coverage and record quality for organizations outside of North America and Europe. Um, so our first project for this is underway with the help from the wonderful folks at La Referencia. I think some of them might be on the call today. Uh, but they're a Latin American network of open access repositories who are involved with all kinds of open scholar scholarship initiatives across the region and in their various countries. Um, we've also been working with um, some of our regional partners in Japan who have done extensive work on reconciling war with some of their national authority projects. And we'll be working to bring our data into closer alignment with those descriptions. Um, if you all are involved with any kind of similar regional group and would like to help us improve metadata in a similar, uh, the raw metadata in a similar fashion, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, it's been very helpful and fruitful for us to be collaborating in that way with those groups in a kind of more formal way. And it's really helped us to improve our coverage and kind of accuracy of records. Um, in addition, beginning last year and continuing into this one, we'll be bringing ROAR and the funder registry into closer alignment with a long-term goal of a merger between the two registries. In terms of organizations currently used in funder assertions in cross reference metadata, we have pretty good coverage. So 90% of all funder assertions with funder IDs use funder IDs that have been assigned to the corresponding ROAR ID value, which, also, which is all just to say that most of the funder assertions can be mapped to ROAR IDs and we include that data in our metadata. But we, of course, want this coverage to be complete and as accurate as possible. So we'll be looking at uh, closing that remaining kind of long tail gap of you know, several thousand organizations that need to be reconciled. Uh, finally, in response to feedback we've received from several integrators, including scholarly publishers and various kind of uh, national initiatives and national research infrastructure, we're exploring ways for capturing and reporting, un uh, reporting unmatched affiliation data to us kind of in a bulk way with an eye to be able to get these organizations added to ROAR. So we know that various integrators have um, kind of a better view than ROAR itself into all the affiliations that exist out there in the world. So we're just looking to kind of suck those up and create as many new high quality records as possible. That's all for me. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, we can pop them in the chat. Otherwise, uh, I'll turn it back over to Maria. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, please drop any questions in chat. And then um, after Liz's portion, we'll have some time for some more questions too. So stay tuned. All right, over to you, Liz, and I'll stop my share so you can begin.
All right. Thank you, Maria. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okie doke. Um, so this year was a big year in terms of technical development for Roar because it was the first year that we actually had a dedicated developer, which is me. So I'm the technical lead. I do a lot of the specification writing, and then I also write the code and do all the infrastructure maintenance um, sorts of activities. But uh, I just started in uh, in that role in February of 2022. So we've been off and running uh, since then. And one of the first things that we started with was formalizing our product development process really with an eye toward making it really transparent as to what we're working on, uh, what the specifications are, what kinds of uh, projects we're collecting feedback on, as well as how the community can contribute. Uh, so we uh, created a new GitHub repository to centralize our feedback collection for all of our different projects. So we have a lot of different uh, little small pieces of software and tools that kind of hold the, the Roar ecosystem together. And it was just easier to have feedback flow through one central repository. So I will pop this into the chat. Oh, thanks, Maria. Um, so you can go ahead and read all the details. It kind of explains what the product development process is. And most importantly, how you can participate if you have ideas or spot any bugs uh, the issues section of this repository is the place to go. So anyone can file uh, issues and then those work their way through uh, product development uh, and review process. Um, a couple of code projects that we worked on uh, this year are adding an advanced search functionality in the API. So now you can search in great detail all of the different fields in Roar records, which are many. So we have the full list of them on this page. And I'll just pop the link to the advanced search into the chat. So that's great, particularly for people who are doing research and are looking to dig into uh, you know, statistics about how many raw records have some kind of external identifier or have some kind of other piece of data in a particular field. Um, one of the tools that we maintain is um, a bit of our API that supports matching text strings, so free text, messy affiliation data to Aurora ID, uh, and we put a, quite a bit of work into improving, improving that um, functionality in the API this year. Uh, nothing terribly fancy to see about that, but it just works uh, better and more accurately than it did previously. Uh, as we have split off from our original grid seed data with our curation process this year, we're also looking forward to, um, to splitting off the schema, the data model uh, in the coming years. So in order to prepare for that, we created a plan for how we are going to version the schema as well as the Roar API. And what that effectively was about is how do we communicate upcoming changes? How do we get feedback from the community? And what is the, uh, what's the schedule uh, for those schema changes? Because those can really impact integrations in the community. So we have a document that we created, which is a bit of a contract with our community saying that, you know, we're not just going to dump massive changes to the data model out there with no warning. We're going to give you at least a year's notice and we'll continue to run uh, two schema versions side by side. So the data dump will be available in two versions. The API will be available in two versions so that everyone has adequate time to prepare for those changes um, and also to provide feedback on our planned and upcoming changes. Um, lastly, one of our big projects this year was launching support for organization status changes in Roar. Um, so previously, Roar only had uh, organizations with a status of active. Um, so there's a status field in each Roar record. Uh, however, organizations aren't necessarily static. They change status. They might merge with, uh, with another organization or split. Uh, and we didn't have a way to accommodate those kinds of changes. However, we had built up a whole lot of curation requests for those kinds of changes. So in December, we added support for other statuses. So we not only have active uh, organizations, but also inactive. So organizations that have 
merged or split or ceased to operate for whatever reason, and then withdrawn organizations, which are those that were either added in error um, or um, were perhaps out of scope for, for ROAR entirely. Uh, so this, uh, you can see both in the data dump and the API, but also in the UI, you can see the different uh, organization statuses. So here's an inactive organization record example. Um, so you have a nice little notification that this is no longer actively maintained. The other bit that we added was uh, a new, well, two new relationship types in the relationship section. So if you come across a record that is inactive, in many cases, you will see a successor organization, one or more in the relationship section that will point you to uh, organizations that are continuing the work of this organization. Um, so that not every single inactive organization, of course, will have a successor, but many do. All right, so coming up in 2023, we have lots of exciting projects. Uh, the biggest is a data model update. So following on from that uh, schema versioning process, we have um, started the process of proposing a new major schema version. And we do, in fact, have a public comment document open for that uh, right now. So we're collecting feedback on our proposed schema version. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so I won't go through all of this in detail because it's a lot. In short, uh, this, the data model that we have currently, we inherited from Grid, and it's got quite a few fields that are duplicative, superfluous, uh, and we'd like to sort of condense some of those together, but also add support for uh, some other bits of data that the community has really been asking us for. Um, something I would really like to draw your attention to if if no other fields uh, impact you, the one that that may is the uh, the name fields. So we welcome everyone's feedback on these changes, but I'm particularly asking uh, people to have a look at the changes that we are proposing to the name field. And this is related a little bit to the question earlier about how we how we choose and manage the main or primary names. So we have a few different options, different ideas for how we better uh, handle names, particularly indicating the language code and indicating what type of name this is. Currently, we have a name field, which is the main name, um, the primary name for the organization. We have several other fields to contain aliases, which are other names the organization is known by, acronyms, um, as well as a field called labels, which is essentially translations of the primary name. But we're looking at different ways to uh, to combine those and better indicate language, um, the language code of each of the each of the names. Uh, so once we complete the feedback on the the data model changes and and come up with a final uh, proposal for those changes, we will implement those. Uh, we plan to release a new schema version uh, around the end of this this year, and we will also. Uh, along with that, release a new API version. Um, but again, as I mentioned, uh, we will continue to run the current uh, API alongside the 2.0 version for another year, and data dumps will be available in both schema versions for a year after we release the new one. Um, we are planning to make some updates to internal curation tools because we have started to get a fairly large volume of curation requests. So we are just going to uh, kind of tidy up and centralize our curation tooling. And as Amanda mentioned, we have, uh, we've seen lots of increase in traffic in our API. They're doing fine for the moment. We actually have um, about 100% uptime for the last uh, nine months at least, but looking forward to the future, we do need to add additional uh, capacity and scalability to our technical infrastructure. So that's a project we'll be working on throughout this year just to prepare for even more use in the future. So if you're interested in keeping track of what we're working on, we uh, we do maintain a sort of high level 
roadmap board, which is not uh, the dirty details of every single project we're working on, but kind of the uh, larger projects that we're working on gives you a good overview of what is planned, what's in progress, and what we've uh, completed at any given time. Um, so thanks, Maria. The link to that, that board is in the chat. So have a look and follow along what we're doing. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back to Maria. Great. Thanks so much, Liz. And thank you, Amanda. And thank you, Adam. I know we've had a few questions coming in to chat uh, related to funder registry, mapping to Roar, and about OJS. Are there any other questions that anyone has right now about what we've been working on and what we will be working on? If you do think of anything that's on your mind, feel free to put it in the chat or stick around at the end of this call uh, to chat with us further. So now I'm going to hand it back over to Amanda to talk about some ways in which you can get more involved uh, in what we're working on in the coming year. So take it away, Amanda. Okay, absolutely. There are many ways you can get more involved with ROAR. Um, the primary way is uh, to join the community advisory group. Uh, we have bi-monthly calls there in which we sort of tell you what we're working on and ask for feedback on um, you know, particular initiatives. And we usually have um, featured integrator presentations where people show what they've been working on. We had a wonderful one from Rob O'Donnell of Rockville University Press. Um, at our previous one. Uh, so that's really the primary way to get involved. And uh, right now, if you'd like to be added to those, those calls, uh, you can email info at war.org um, and we will add you to that list and invite you to those meetings. Um, you can contribute feature requests and bug reports on GitHub. Um, as we mentioned, we have many war repositories, including um, the updates repository where we show what people are requesting, um, additions and modifications to rural records, and also the roadmap. If you have a feature suggestion, uh, we've shared that link several times. Um, you can always contribute that to our roadmap. Um, we have um, uh, just recently sort of re-upped our um, RUAR Utilities Repository, and we've rewritten some contribution guidelines for that. We're aware of a lot of people who are writing scripts that do things with RUAR, um, and uh, we would love to share those with people in kind of a central place. Um, if, you, if you even do a search on GitHub um, for, for utilities that use RUAR, you'll find a lot of things in people's own repositories, and we're trying to sort of begin to at least centralize some of these, especially the ones that are kind of um, abstract enough so that people can reuse them. And there are um, some that we've written as well. Um, so we're just beginning to accept these sort of code contributions. Um, of course, a very popular way for everyone around the world to participate in war is to look up your own organization's record and suggest corrections to it. Always welcome to do that. And it doesn't have to be your own organization. You can really look at any record and say, hey, I think this should be X, Y, Z. Uh, and then um, we do have a uh, curation advisory board. Um, but we have uh, several members of that on this call. And we um, can, if you'd like to volunteer for that, please email registry at war.org. Next slide. Um, we do also have some um, sort of asynchronous discussion things. Um, the Roar Tech Forum is really kind of crucial to sign up for if you are a Roar API user in particular, because we do make announcements there whenever we update the registry and whenever we're sort of planning um, changes to the API, whether it's improvements um, or just, you know, um, planned uh, changes such as the ones coming up that will be entailed by uh, the schema revamp. Um, we also have a discussion board on our roadmap. We, we also put announcements there and invite comment. Uh, you can join our war Slack if you like. Uh, and then there are two sort of um, external forums where we do participate uh, quite a lot. So the PID forum, some of you may already be members of that. That's where Datasite in particular does do quite a bit of community 
um, um, interaction. So uh, really, if you're interested in ORCIDs uh, or DOIs or rural IDs or other PIDs, uh, you can sign up for the PID forum to see announcements and discussions there. And then the Crossref Community Forum has a ROAR tag as well. Um, and so if you're specifically interested in ROAR IDs in Crossref metadata, that may be the place to ask about that. Next slide. Uh, and then if you want to just sort of get updates, uh, we do have a newsletter. We have the link to that that you can sign up for. And that goes out, I believe, um, uh, roughly quarterly. And uh, we do still have a Twitter account and we have a quite new Mastodon account where you can follow us. And um, we uh, are post on LinkedIn. And then we do also have a YouTube channel, um, which uh, I actually, need to add some more videos to. Uh, we have some videos that still need to be added there. And so we're just beginning to recurate that where we have some how-to videos. And then a lot of, we're trying to sort of collect a lot of presentations that people have been doing about war at external events as well. Next slide. Um, how can you support war? Well, integrate it into your system. That's a great way to do it. Um, ask people that you're, uh, that you work with, you know, um, software that you use, and uh, perhaps you, you know, pay a vendor, see if they're um, interested in, in integrating ROAR, um, send ROAR IDs to, uh, um, in your DOIs. I think, I know we have a number of people, that OJS plugin is one that we're actually really interested in, because obviously lots and lots of people use OJS, and there is a terrific ROAR plugin, and then one of the um, you know, features that remains to be developed for that plugin is to enable people to send ROAR IDs to data site and Crossref um, when they have adopted that plugin. So we are, we are working on that. Um, it just may take a little bit. Uh, advocate for ROAR as part of um, bid policies at your organization. Talk about ROAR with your networks. And of course, you can, if you like, contribute to our sustainability fund. We always welcome financial donations. Next slide. Is I think the last one. That's it. I think this brings us to the end. And thank you, Amanda, for reviewing all those different ways in which you can be involved. I hope that all of you here, if you're not already involved in what we're working on, will consider doing so. Um, as I mentioned, this is really a community supported and community based initiative, and that depends on, on your active engagement and involvement. So look forward to doing more with all of you in the coming year. Uh, this has been a really big milestone for ROAR to reach its um, fourth anniversary um, to, to have been around for four years. And that's really a testament to all of the support and engagement from, from you and the wider community to get to this point. So we're really excited about what has happened in the past year and also really excited about what is um, what we're looking ahead to uh, in, in the coming year. So thank you all for being part of this. So we will bring this to an end because we're coming to top of the hour. After I stop the recording, uh, we'll hang out for a few more minutes for some informal chat. Uh, the slides and the recordings will be circulated to everyone um, later this week or beginning of, of next week. We have a few more sessions we're doing this week. So I hope you are all um, ready to roar and roaring already as we move into this new year. Thank you all for being part of this. I need to stop the recording now and we will hang out for a few more minutes for anyone who wants to chat.